Hi, and welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come to talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we host a distinguished guest, and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the general ups and downs of making a life in music. So, whether you're a grizzled veteran asking your nephew to set up a SoundCloud account for you, or else a scrappy upstart, asking your uncle how to hook up his old reel-to-reel tape machine. This is your show, because ultimately, it is what every writer seeks most, an ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. Hey everybody, it's the fourth Friday of July 2022, and I thank you for joining us. This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. I'm old enough to remember when you had to pay somebody called a web developer to get a website made, and it would always be some guy named Lance who drove a 97 Ford Explorer with flames on the side. And who's always trying to sell you DVDs of the director's commentary to the movie Gattaca. And old Lance would charge you about a thousand bucks for a website that would be obsolete in six months. But it's the future now, you guys. That's not how it works anymore. We're allowed to have nice things now. One of those nice things is Banzoogle. Banzoogle powers the websites of tens of thousands of musicians around the world. From weekend warriors to Grammy winners. All the features you need for a professional website are already built in. Hosting in a custom domain name, dozens of fully customizable design templates, tools to sell your music and merch commission-free. Listeners to the Working Songwriter Podcast can go to bandzoogle.com to try it for free for 30 days. Use the promo code TWS, the initials of our show, TWS, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. If you'd like to hear some of my music live in the coming weeks, the first Sunday night of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern, I'm over on my YouTube channel for Sunday Songs. That's a live stream. I'm live. I'm playing tunes live. I'm taking questions in the live chat. I'm taking requests in the live chat. It's a really fun, really interactive experience. I dare to say that we're building something of a little community over there on Sunday nights, including many people who are listeners to this podcast. So come on over and be a part of it. That's the first Sunday night of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern over on YouTube. Head on over to JoePugMusic.com and click on the live stream tab to set a reminder. Finally, if you enjoy this podcast, if you'd like to help it remain a viable endeavor for me, here's a couple things that you could do to help. First, you could become a supporter of the show over at Patreon. Patreon is a platform that allows you to directly support creative endeavors that you find meaningful. You just head to their site, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, you search for The Working Songwriter or you search for my name, and then you sign up to kick in a few bucks every month for the show. Think of it as a voluntary subscription, a subscription that you certainly don't have to pay for, but that you choose to pay for because you dig the show and because you won't miss a few bucks at the end of the month. If just 1% of our listenership would kick in the price of a cup of coffee every month, it would make an immense difference. So thank you to everybody who's taken the time and capital to support the show in that way. And if you're not in a position to support the show in that way, I totally get it. You can still help out the show for free by either leaving us a rating in the iTunes store, or second, by simply telling a friend about the show, spreading the word about the show. The simple math on those two things is that they will help me much more than they will be a pain in the ass for you. Okay, I'll end all the harassment there. It should be noted uh, that this interview cuts off a little bit abruptly. That's because I was interviewing Judah during a summer thunderstorm here in Maryland. And during the last segment, I lost all the power at my studio. Uh, So we had to call it good. I think it was still a great chat. It just cuts off a little bit earlier than you would uh, normally expect. Thanks to Judah for being a part of the show, and thank you for listening. Our guest this week was playing baseball for Belmont University in Nashville when he formed a band that would change his life. 
Judah Akers is the principal songwriter behind Judah and the Lion, an independent folk band that has earned a devoted following all around the country. They've toured with 21 Pilots, Incubus, Jimmy Eat World, and many others. They've appeared on Late Night with David Letterman, Late Night with Seth Meyers, Good Morning America, The Late Late Show with James Corden, and Jimmy Kimmel Live. They've appeared at Lollapalooza, Austin City Limits, and Outside Lands. American Songwriter says that Judah and the Lion make a mighty roar. Atwood Magazine describes them as bold, big-hearted, and unapologetically buoyant. Paste Magazine calls them anthemic and wildly creative. I got a chance to catch up with Judah on the phone last week to hear about his journey so far. Judah Akers of Judah and the Lion, thanks so much for being a part of the Working Songwriter podcast. Uh, I know that you know your story that a lot of people know started in uh, in in Nashville, where you were going to school at Belmont, where your your band was formed. But before that, um, growing up, where did you grow up, and and what did music look like in your household? Yeah, so for me, I I grew up kind of a major jock, played a lot of sports growing up, and. Um, my freshman year of high school, actually, I was kind of forced because of an injury not to play sports for about six months because of a back injury. And um, my uncle at the time, he had kind of begged me to to learn how to play guitar because I, w- I was super into like choir and vocals and stuff like that and dancing and really like loved music, but never really kind of just because of sports, the busyness of it. I never really kind of wanted to pursue it. And so that six months when I was in a back brace, my uncle was like, well, you don't have a choice now. I'm teaching you how to play guitar. So he, he was also kind of pastoring a church there in town. And, and so when I, when I grew up, he was like, well, we don't have a youth band. So, um, of course, me not knowing how to play guitar, not really seeing going through puberty, started a youth church band. And that was kind of the start that I guess the origin of kind of my musical journey, just kind of getting up there and making a fool of myself every week and kind of really learning how to. I don't know, cultivate a voice, even though I was squeaking that my uncle would always make fun of me for, um, since the puberty was kind of hitting strong and I just fell in love with music and dancing and, um, just kind of songwriting was almost kind of all at the same time. Like I, even when I could only play it a G and a C chord, I just, I loved the fact that you could write your own words and music. And, um, I just fell in love with it. The older I get, sometimes I think it was actually easier and better to write a song when you just knew a G and C chord. Uh, That's so true. That one and four, those are the beautiful ones right there. Those are the good ones. So it sounds like your your uncle was quite the uh, the influence on you there. What what type of music was he turning you on to? If he was the one saying, you got to learn to play guitar, what were the songs that he thought were really necessary for you to learn? Well, like, like I said, we, we were, it was kind of started in the church. A lot of it was kind of church uh, oriented, but my uncle and my mom um, were big influences on just my musical path because they were into bands like Ario Speedwagon, R.E.M., Tom Petty, um, Elton John, those type of kind of influences. And so when I was learning it, even though it was kind of rooted in, in spirituality, um, which I, I think is kind of an important part of the reason why I like, write the lyrics that I do, um, there was also like those um, really heavily like rock iconic influences that um him and my mom especially were into. So when we were in the car, we, that's that's what, what we were listening to. So you went to, um, uh, you were playing ball at Belmont, right? I but did. It seems, but it seems that you probably could have played baseball in a lot of different places if you were playing at, at that level. So I'm thinking that one of the reasons you went to Belmont had something to do with music, right? It did. It was like, uh, I, I wanted to go to Belmont, just regardless of the sport I was playing, as it going to be the basketball or baseball and ended up working out with baseball and um, that the goal was always music. I, I just loved songwriting. Um, obviously Belmont has a, an amazing reputation for music and learning how to cultivate your voice as a songwriter, as a music business person or whatever you were kind of wanting to study. And so it was very enticing for me. So what were you learning? What are some of like the key lessons that you took away from some of those? H- how did they form you as a songwriter in a way that you hadn't been formed before you got there? Well, I think a lot, and, it, and this goes with life in general, but I think it's just a lot of like who you surround yourself with. You know, when when we got to Belmont, it was 
I was, you know, like in a small town, kind of the only one that was kind of really aspiring to be like a songwriter. And when you get to Belmont, all of a sudden, it's like all these kids are so much better than you are. They can sing better. And um, you can either let that intimidate you or inspire you. And, and my personality has kind of always wanted to look on the, the head, like the nicer side of life. So it was really inspiring for me to be around, um, you know, these friends that were just so talented that were kind of just going for it. They'd start punk bands here. They'd start, you know, heavy metal bands here. There's a pop band, you know, and, and so it just kind of, it didn't mean that it was like uh, easy, but it was just kind of like, oh, I can do it. You know, they're doing it. I'm going to try it. And um, I, I just think being in places like that, or um, you have this like sonic energy that is really beautiful. And for our band, it was like, that was a big part of kind of our story is we were just, you know, kids that didn't really even know anything about folk music. Um, but we started this folk band after being kind of more into like rock, rock bands previous to it. And um, what, for whatever the sound, you know, that we kind of have come to know now as, as our band, um, it really kind of started with that spirit of just like, we can do it, you know? Yeah. What was some of that folk music that you started to fall in love with and, and set you on fire? Yeah, it was so interesting. Cause uh, you know, I, I, before I met the guys, um, you know, they, they had just picked up the banjo. Nate at the time was the only banjo major. Brian at the time was the only mandolin major. I was studying music business and the, the songwriting side. Um, so they had just picked up those songs i was like in kind of this rock synthy band and so i think um it just during that time that was when kind of like the mumfords were kind of coming up lumineers were coming up and i honestly you know maybe sadly didn't didn't really know about those bands at the time and then um started really getting in diving into like what they were doing and um, bands like bears den and these folk bands that were coming out of england at the time were just i don't know really inspiring for what we were trying to do because we had no clue what we were doing with the instruments we were playing and um my anthemic type uh you know rock songs that i was writing it didn't necessarily fit the mold of like the the, the banjo and the mandolin but um we were like really inspired by it um so those those bands of course kind of paid paved the way and um, they're like probably 10 years ahead of us and you know that's a it's a beautiful kind of pathway and then we ended up kind of wanting, wanting to lean more into the rock and the hip-hop thing which kind of makes us who we are now there is something to that though because you mentioned earlier well you know when i started i just knew the gnc chord you mentioned with your bandmates that you started out with like well they were just learning these instruments there is something to that though of when you were kind of limited in, in your facility as a musician it really makes it all the more important that you have something to say with, with the songs themselves in a way that once you get better at your instrument, once you become great in the studio, you can have great mixes going on. A lot of that can patch up a lot of the uh, the need for a great song or a great lyric or a great meaning. And I just think it's really interesting that, uh, uh, that, that you're speaking to that in a way, that it's like, you know, starting out, yeah, we didn't know a whole lot at first, but we could still write songs that were compelling. Yeah, I think that that is so important as as a songwriter. I I we when we made this last record, me and Brian, we were kind of learning um, new instruments. I was learning how to play the mandolin. He was learning how to um, play the banjo, and, and he's he's a much more skilled musician than I am. But it was it brought this like childlike energy to the songwriting and made us kind of focus more on like the mel like the melody and what we were saying, just like we were saying. And and sometimes that just can kind of open up a different world, you know, that you didn't know it existed. Cause I, I'm going to play a man mandolin so much, you know, worse than Brian because Brian's, you know, this trained, you know, mandolin player, but it brought, it brought this like energy that, that kind of opened up and unlocked things in us that we didn't know we had. Totally. One of my favorite, favorite bands, favorite songwriters, Sprite and Rabbit. I think that they do that so beautifully just with like all these major chords that I don't want to say that it's simple musically, but it's beautiful but he had all these crazy lyrics that were just so impactful. Um, and sometimes the, the music can kind of, if it's simpler or more beautiful, it, it, it lets it kind of sit a little bit easier on your heart than it being all this like compli these complicated lyrics and these complicated chords. It just kind of sits with you. So I, 
I'm sure that there are plenty of people forming bands at uh, at Belmont in Nashville. Um, how did you guys get it going in a way where here you are a decade later, very successfully still playing music? Like, how did you get it off the ground from, hey, we're some guys that are majoring in a few things at Belmont to this is a band. We're doing this now and people are coming to shows and it's working. Oh, man, that's a golden question right there. I don't even know how um, we we did put our head down for about eight years um in a van in a trailer and you know we put like around over two hundred thousand miles in that van and um played around 200 shows a year kind of the way that the old rock bands used to do it and um, we just loved being on the road i mean it was um i don't want to say our addiction but we 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 realized when the pandemic happened that we were we were out a lot (laughs) and then it's just like again it's like who you surround yourself with we have an amazing team that works their asses off and um, we like, we just follow suit with that. We, we love what we do. And so we feel really lucky to be able to be making music 10 years now and hopefully 10 more years, we, we will see how it goes. But, um, I, I hate to say it, but it, 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 if I feel like now, um, and, and me and the guys kind of attest to this, it's like, we, we really do feel like we, we kind of worked our, our butts off to kind of get that, the touring going. And then, um, then you know, we've had now our team that really believed in a couple of our songs and then the songs kind of took off. And then, um, but the, the foundation of it was the the touring, to be honest, it was getting, getting out there and playing the, the crappy shows that nobody comes to. And you're doubting yourself about pretty much everything and what you're doing. And, and so is, you know, certain people back home asking questions like, what the heck are you doing? And then, you know, and then some, something happens and then, um, we were on David Letterman and then, then we had a song on the radio and, you just never really know. I just kind of, I, I'm, I'm a Southern boy. It's like, put your head down and work hard and, and see what happens. What do you remember from those early days touring? Cause obviously, you know, you go around when you're starting a tour, you're carrying a trailer behind you. And uh, yeah, obviously some of those shows are going to be, you know, San Luis Obispo on a Tuesday night to nobody. And you're kind of bummed out, but there had to be, what are some of the first shows that you remember where there are people showing up and you're like, Oh man, this, this might be a thing. This might actually work. Yeah, the ones that the ones that keep you going. Um, I, I, the the one of the coolest memories that I have was um, we were I was playing so I was playing college baseball. We would go on these house show tours during the summer when I wasn't playing because it was, it was more difficult to play during um, you know my season, whether it, whether it be like practice or essentially the school season. And um, we would go on these house show tours and uh, we, we went on a couple and it was like these house show tours that would be like, Hey, you know, we want to come to your house. Maybe your mom could feed us uh, and we'll sleep on your floors and, you know, be on, on to the next city. And so we did like some shows in North Carolina, Texas, Nashville, uh, my hometown, Cookville, Texas, Denver, Chicago. And um, the, the next summer we were like, since the, sh- the house shows went so well, we we're like, let's just book a venue outside of town and just see what happens. And our mentors and managers at the time were like, you can't book this room, blah, blah. It's like, you know, we were booking it ourselves. I remember I, I had, um, I made up an email that was like Judah and the Lions booking agent at Gmail or .com or whatever. And I was the one that was like operating it. So it looked a little bit more legit. And so I, anyways, this, this club in Athens, Georgia kind of took a risk on us. And um, we, we get to the show and it's like 500 cap room. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it was sold out. People were singing the songs and we were like, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> and it really was like, that was like the first show that we kind of, you know, we went backstage in this really cool grimy green room. And um, I mean, I really think we like actually punched a hole in the wall. We were so excited. I, oh, yeah. I, I don't know the hole's still there, but we, we just looked at each other. I was like, I, I was in tears looking at Brian. Just like, I, I don't know what just happened, but I, let's keep doing this. Like, I don't know. Um, yeah. So a few of those shows just, you get that kind of become your staples or like this, you know, spots where you kind of put your memories and you're like, man, thank you so much for those 500, you know, Georgia students that came to the show and were somehow singing the songs. Um, that was, that was a beautiful moment. Yeah. Not to mention getting a payout for selling 500 tickets. I mean, when you're that age, you're like, wait, what are you paying me right now? I, yeah, I, we were I like, can leave with this right now. We were like, we just made a grand. We're rich. <laughs> we're like you get $200. You get $200. <laughs> making it rain, making it rain. Uh, now, what are uh, the flip side of the coin? Can you remember, uh, you know, uh, in that very early uh, mode, uh, 
and now you can probably look back at it with a sense of humor. What was something, a, a show that you played where you were like, damn, man, like this ain't going to work. We might have to go back to the drawing board. Uh, this is a dark one. Unfortunately, there's more of those shows than there were the the, the good <laughs> memories at, at the start. But um, there's two to come to mind. And I'll keep it short. Um, but the, on one of the house show tours that we did, um, the last show was in this place called Cer- Cersei, Arkansas. And, and honestly, like the shows went really well. It's like at least like 100 people were showing up kind of. Right. Mm-hmm. Her. It, it was mostly just word of mouth. People just being like, hey, come check this band out. They're coming to my house, whatever. Um, and we get to this this house, this very kind of humble house in Cersei. And um, we're setting everything up. And it's just this family of four. There's a two-year-old and, and like a newborn. And so we're like, this is going to get chaotic. Um, but they had this like stew for us. And we were, you know, whatever, getting ready for the night. About eight o'clock when the show was about to start, or we thought it, we were supposed to. We were like, hey, like what? when's everybody coming? And they were like, oh, we didn't invite anyone. <laughs> so, so we played the show, no joke, full hearted for this couple. And then they they cut us off like 30 minutes because they had to put their baby down to sleep. So we were like, <laughs> and it was the last show of the tour. We were like, oh my gosh, we're never doing that again. And but that was epic. It was like, well, we, we at least got some good stew and we went, we went back home. Like I think we like left early, you know, whatever. And then a little bit further along, like three years down the road, when like we were, you know, selling more tickets in cities and like things were kind of like looking up, we get to our show, the show in Louisville, 21 and up club, which is not really a good look for us at the time. And it was like a Tuesday night in Louisville. And we were actually stoked about it because Louisville's kind of relatively close to Nashville where we started. So we were like, I don't know, this could be a good show. We get there and, uh, n- I think there was five people there and they were all on the guest list. <laughs> that it was our, it was like our, our host home that night, family, friends, that came. <laughs> not one extra person. And um, I'll never forget that night though. Cause uh, you know, it, I think sometimes those are kind of easy to phone in for bands and I don't, I don't know who the main market is for your podcast here, but if you are a young band, we, we kind of made this rule. It's like, if we don't give our best here, then we don't deserve, like, I think we had Bonnaroo, like, scheduled already during that time. It's so, like, we don't deserve to go out and play Bonnaroo. Um, right. Like, we, we're we going to give um, the McGee's, the, the family that was there, we're going to give them, like, the best show that, that we can for the night. And, and it was obviously really funny because it's family, friends, but we, we gave as much energy. So I, that was, like, a moment for the band that was, like, we didn't phone it in, you know, we, we kind of looked at ourselves like proud. And then, then when we played Bonner, you know, you're obviously remembering that show and yeah. So and those, those memories are the, are the ones that you remember. It's, it's kind of funny. Yeah. Well, and they also define who you are because you can phone in the show in Louisville. And when you do show up at Belmont and you're not the only talented person there, you can phone it in then and say, it's not going to work. But those are the defining moments when you make a choice, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Make a choice to, um, give it give it all give it all you had and yeah it's uh and, and then and then when the big shows do come it's like that's what you remember you know it's like if we we didn't give up we we pressed through and even though we probably won't probably should have quit music or something you know like um uh, looking back at some of those shows but it was um yeah uh, those are the ones that you remember Getting better at your instrument is an essential part of being a songwriter. When you play better guitar, you write better songs. It's that simple. How do you do that, though? Sure, you could get lessons from the neighbor who majored in EDM composition at Swarthmore, but that'll cost you an arm and a leg. Or else you could pull up YouTube and pay nothing at all, but that becomes the ultimate time suck. You'll end up sifting through videos of nerds unironically weeping as they mimic Victor Wooten fretless bass solos. What's the sweet spot in between? Peghead Nation, the online home for American Roots music. They feature curated video workshops with world-class instructors on guitar, mandolin, banjo, fiddle, upright bass, dobro, and ukulele. They have levels of instruction that meet the needs of both scrappy upstarts and grizzled veterans, and most importantly of all, it comes in at a low monthly subscription that actual strapped-for-cash songwriters can actually afford. 
To start taking classes yourself, head on over to PegheadNation.com to check out their 50 available courses. Enter the promo code TWS to get your first month free. You can also send a gift subscription to the songwriter in your life or to the player in your band who needs a not-so-subtle hint about their playing prowess. Peghead Nation, when you play better guitar, you write better songs. It's that simple. Hearing Judah talk about how raw his musical skills were when he first began is a good reminder of what is really important when you're attempting to create compelling art. Technique isn't the first thing that matters or counts, although it's good for that to arrive later. What's important is the spirit in which the endeavor is taken. And there's a wonderful poem about focusing on that side of life by G.K. Chesterton. It's entitled, North Berwick. On the sands, I romped with children. Do you blame me that I did not improve myself by bottling anemones? But I say that these children will be men and women, and I say that the anemones will not be men and women, not just yet at least, let us say. And I say that the greatest men of the world might romp with children and that I should like to see Shakespeare romping with children, and Browning and Darwin romping with children, and Mr. Gladstone romping with children, and Professor Huxley romping with children, and all the bishops romping with children. And I say that if a man had climbed to the stars and found the secrets of the angels, the best thing and the most useful thing he could do would be to come back and romp with children. Talk to me about, um, we've been talking a lot about live music here. Talk to me about the record making process that you guys have done over the years. You guys have worked with uh, Dave Cobb a lot, very well-known uh, producer in Nashville, has produced a ton of stuff. Uh, talk to me about making, you made your first record with him, Kids These Days, right? You made a few with him. Right. Yeah, we we made um, kids these days and full cop and roll with Dave Cobb, and he 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 was amazing to work with because we were, you know, we were kind of a young band um, coming out of Belmont. We'd either graduated or dropped out, and he really kind of took a risk on us because at, at that time he was he was producing some bigger stuff. He had, he had just won a Grammy, and um, but he he gave us like the the indie rate or whatever his his rate was at the time that because we we couldn't afford like the big. And he, he would, he just, you know, pushed us to, to do things kind of in a different way. We, we didn't do anything to click at the time. Um, I, I remember after like one of my vocal takes, something I'll never forget, because I'm a little bit of a control controller. I, I like to, you know, control things. And um, I, I'd like missed a note. I was like pitchy during like one of the verses or something. And he was like, uh, that's the take. And I, I just remember being like, what, like, what, there's no way, like, I, let's just get it right. He's like, no, there, there was a feeling in that vocal take, um, which, you know, for me at the time was like, no, I want to make it perfect. But he, he kind of taught us this like thing of like, that's not music, like music, it needs to be raw and felt. And if it's like from the heart, you can feel it. And if it's like just a little pitchy, it's not like it was like a terrible note, but you know, right. He, he just kind of taught us, like, he pushed us in that way. It's like, this is what music is about. It's like, we want to feel it. It doesn't need to be perfect. We want that raw, like, heart energy. And um, and then he was the one that actually helped us move from the stand-up bass that we were playing with at the time. And, and he put us uh, on a Moog Mo bass synthesizer, which kind of, honestly, just kind of transformed our, you know, our origin of sound. Because, we, you know, we, at the first part of our band, like, we were getting compared to Lemonier's. You know, um, Marcus Mumford has this kind of growly voice. Obviously, I'm I'm more southern, but you know, we have the banjo, and, and um, it really kind of set us a, on a different trajectory than just being the next thing that sounded like another you know folk band that that they were already doing. Obviously, in a very very high level, 
Um, so they, they really pushed us in that way. So those first two records were kind of monumental for us. Was it a hard thing to let go when you hear someone say that's the take and you don't want it to be the take? And, and how did you how did you let go of that? I think at the time it was like, well, he's got it. He's got a Grammy and he's smarter than me, but it was hard to let go. <laughs> I was like, I, I, you know, cause you know, I, for me, I was like, I don't want to be embarrassed. Like I, yeah. I, I'm not pitchy all the time, but you know, every now, every now and then it's like, yeah, man, that was a bad note, whatever. Um, but we can re-record it. You know, that was my thought, but I, after he kind of explained it and I sat with it, it, it was kind of, um, our, me and our banjo player, we're, we're the ones that really kind of had to suck up that ego and be like, okay, this is, this is what music is, even though we want it to be like technically correct. And we want it to be perfect quote unquote. At the end of the day, it's like, that's just not music or not the music that we want to make. We, we want to make music that's raw. Um, again, that, that hopefully is heart forward and genuinely felt. Um, and Dave just kind of taught us that it's like, don't, don't overthink it. Like, that, that one felt great. It's funny. I feel like back in the day, music that was like perfectly in pitch and perfectly in time would have been the exception. But now we live in a world where everything's to the grid. Everything is all vocals are tuned, this, that, and the other. So you're actually having to make a very um, serious artistic choice to say, we're, we're not going to do that. That's, that's not what we're going for. It's actually, if we do that, we'll just be one among many at this mm-hmm. point. Right. Yeah, I think that's obviously what we're seeing a little bit now. It's like, I think our gut, we, me and Brian talked about even like the next record, possibly just going back to four or five, like just seeing what we could do with three or four instruments and just seeing what that rawness could feel like. Going back to what you said earlier about just the innocence of that and um, music, obviously, it in, in, a, in a good way. Um, and we, we've had music like this as well, so we're not far from that, but I think the, the rawness is what, and that authenticity is what people are kind of craving for, um, you know, in this era of TikTok and, you know, things that there are, I, I don't want to say disingenuine because those things have their place. And I think they impact a lot of people, but um, I think, I think the world is kind of craving for some more of that um, Dave Cobbness for lack of a better term. <laughs> well, that's a good term. I haven't heard that term before, but it's a good one. Don't Dave, I said that. I, I will. I will. Um, <laughs> not that I know him, but I'll, I'll, I'll tweet it at him or something. Um, how do you approach songwriting these days? If you have a couple days to write or, or, you know, like what does the writer's room look like to you? Yeah. I mean, so I, I'm my songwriting, I, again, I, I was such a, and like a sports dude. And so I, um, I am not the writer that, goes and like tries to write every single day i have a lot of friends that do that that it works really well for them um for me i'm so seasonal like i i need i need time to go live life and figure out like what i'm what i'm personally going through that i you know in some ways can connect my story to someone else's story and for me that's not just going and and writing every day because it'll just be like bad song after bad song um I think I, I just like to sit in a season just for a second and take a month or two month break um, after a record or whatever, when we have the time or, you know, during a tour and, and then wait. And then a lot of times when I wait, it's like, when do you go back to it? Um, sometimes it just flows so much better. And again, you're, you're not going back to your old tricks. It feels like you have kind of new, this new kind of palette for, songwriting that I didn't have before. I, I, I don't want to do like a baseball analogy, but I, um, I was a hitter in college. And, um, when I, when we went, went down for the summer or whatever, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't probably hit, I wouldn't swing a bat for like two months. Um, because a lot of times, at least for me as a hitter, it was like you get in the middle of the season and all of a sudden you're thinking about everything. It's like, you're thinking about where you're, elbow is like where your lead foot's going, where your back foot and your squish foot, like where, where are my hands? And then when you take a break from it and then come back, that natural swing is back and you're not thinking anything. All of a sudden the ball's, you know, flying off the bat. And and I feel like that way from, at least from my experience, um, it really works. Like you kind of come back to your natural, like don't overthink it. Let's make music the way that it's supposed to. And um, that's, that's the way that I kind of roll. 
How has your process changed the most over the last 10 years? In what ways do you think you've improved as a songwriter over the last 10 years? I think, yeah, I mean, I think I just, I, I personally just went through a whole lot of life. Um, my parents went through a really difficult season. Um, about six years ago, I um, had family members that have committed suicide and um, I even have kind of suffered through like through the pandemic and stuff with my own kind of version of depression and what it's like to like really cope in bad ways and good ways and healthy ways and, and not so healthy ways. And um, that to me as like a songwriter is, um, you know, it, I, I don't want to say that songwriters have to be tortured or anything like that, but um, you know, I influenced by people like Frightened Rabbit um, or Bears Den that, that write about like what they're going through and can hopefully impact someone else. That's just been such a big part. Like it's almost being set free to be honest. And so I started actually coping a lot through songwriting. And I think that that's, that's not only like maybe selfishly helped me and my, my healing, but um, I think it's, it's improved just the, the, the progress of my songwriting. You know, it's not just um, roses and sunrises all the time or whatever. And I think going through life it kind of teaches you those things of like, Oh, I, I can actually cope through this way and, and process um, through what I'm going through, through the song. And in that way, hopefully can impact, you know, someone else. What do you think it is about writing about um, an experience that helps you cope with it? I think that it, you know, I, I wrote pep talks a lot about just what I was going through at the time with um, my parents and they kind of just got in a divorce in a, in a pretty explosive way. And, um, you know, I, I go, I look back at those songs now, it's been four years and it's like, dang, I was mad. It was like, you know, dang, that was like an angry song. Like I can't, I would, or dang, I, that was so sad. Um, and I, so I think songwriting, like, just like journaling for anyone that's not a songwriter, it, it helps you put emotions on like a physical thing. So you can kind of remove yourself from that. So like, there's a song called don't mess with my mama. That was, you know, obviously very angry at my dad and all this stuff. And it's like, now I'm like me and my dad are better than ever. But it's like in that season, in that moment, man, I was like so pissed off at my dad. <laughs> so it kind of, it, for me, it kind of helps me put it in like this um, portal and, yeah. and I can kind of move on from it. Yeah, it kind of stamps it to a time and place that isn't necessarily now. I don't have to live with it anymore. Exactly. Um, it, even though it's still meaningful and hopefully meaningful to other people, even though it's still in this portal, it, it journaling, having time in a space of writing down like what you're going through, you can just kind of see it and it doesn't have to stay in your brain. You know, you can process through it and, then, you know, move on. Talk to me about, you guys have a new record out this year uh, named Revivals and, uh, how did you make this particular one? How is it different than past album process? It sounds like to a certain degree, you were fumbling around on new instruments to, to get some inspiration, but you know, what other, uh, what other techniques were you using for this one that sets it apart from other albums? Well, I mean, probably cliche to say now, but the, the pandemic um, just made everything a whole lot different. We, me and Brian both um, started like side projects over the pandemic. Cause you know, there was just not, there was just so many songs that were kind of coming um, he started a solo project. I started a couple, um, just honestly, like when we talked about it, I was just like, let's just explore like some chops. Like, let's just, it doesn't have to be the biggest side projects in the world, but you know, let's just go in on our own. And I, I was making music kind of on my own with a buddy and uh, Brian was making his own Sweden. So when we got back together, it was like, he had improved exponentially just on his rig with logic and, mandolin especially and um you know his songwriting and then i was kind of coming at it from this like punk rock you know more like mainstream or whatever but i i was you know at the time i was kind of forced to make music by myself which wasn't traditionally like the case you know we have our buddy drew long that makes these records with us but you know after the pandemic he had made this record by himself in sweden i was making music kind of by myself in my life and so when we got together, it was like, now we have, you know, our, our producer friend and now we have all these skill sets that we didn't have. And obviously a lot of life was lived lyrically at the time. Um, so it, it was just, I, dare, I mean, dare I say it was just like the most patient record we'd ever had. 
um, we got to travel to um, Asheville to to actually record it at a studio called Echo Mountain that was just perfect. It was like in the fall and the trees were doing their smoky, you know, thing. Like the, the mountains are just so beautiful up there. And um, it was just really inspiring to be in a studio that a lot of our favorite bands like Band of Forces and Manchester Orchestra and Dawes and all these iconic bands, you know, where, where they previously recorded. Um, so outside of just the innocence of us kind of dabbling with new instruments and um, all that, our banjo player decided not to be a part of the band during the pandemic as well. So it was, that was, and it was like a, and it was a beautiful send off. It wasn't like anything like um, that or anything. It was just, I think the pandemic kind of taught him like he just didn't really love touring and um, all that stuff. So it was, it was just all kind of innocent and fresh and even like lyrically, um, I think that's what we both like wanted to find again um, with the record, like revival. Like, so what does that mean for us? And it's like a lot of times that rebirth or that awakening moment can mean like becoming like a kid again and being innocent. And sometimes like, like the pandemic for a lot of us, um, you know, in our life, like our innocence gets and somehow some way, some, some for kids like that are really young and some for adults, you get that innocence kind of robbed of you. This week's show is brought to you by Bandzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Bandzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. Use promo code TWS, the initials of our podcast, TWS, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Judah and the Lion's latest album is entitled Revival, available everywhere music is sold or streamed. If before we meet again you sit down to write, please remember... An expensive drug habit is not a song. A compelling Instagram account is not a song. And most importantly, reverb is not a song. So let all that take care of itself. And for you, just keep your eye on the song.